Ja. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Plattner, dear Professor Kretschmer, dear Professor Fedorovic, Mr. President, Professor Dennis, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to Munich. I'm really delighted that we are hosting this event in this very special year. Congratulations on 40 years of the International Conference on Information Systems and 25 years of the Association for Information Systems. On this occasion, I also extend the best wishes and greetings from our Bavarian Minister President, Dr. Markus Söder, and the entire Bavarian state government. This year, the conference is being held for the first time in Germany. And we are really proud that is, it is Munich that you chose. Because uh, some of you may have wondered why in Munich and not in Berlin. I know that many think of Berlin when it comes to startup and digitalization. But um, I have to say Berlin may be hip and sexy to use a common cliche, but researchers and startups need more than just a scene to party. What they need is a reliable infrastructure and a reliable legal and economic framework. In short, they need a sustainable digital ecosystem. Only in this way can we ensure that cutting edge research is carried out and startups will become productive and successful companies. This is exactly what you will find in Bavaria. We are hip, sexy, and reliable. <laughs> Bavaria really is a great place to live and work. Here in Bavaria, we can do raves and research, microbreweries and megabytes, Glühwein and gigabits. This is one of the reasons why Bavaria is home to the happiest IT specialists and to digital hotspots. Let me just mention the DLD conference of Burda Media, the Innovation and Startup Festival, the Munich Management Colloquium of Technical University of Munich, the Bits and Pretzels Founders Conference during the Oktoberfest, and last but not least, all of you during this Christmas market period it all comes down to good timing. You in Bavaria are playing in the very top league, as Apple boss Tim Cook recently commented when he visited the engineers at the Munich Design Lab. He should know. When it comes to high-tech and digital, Bavaria has a great deal to offer. The biggest names in the digital revolution came and come to Munich, Europe's IT capital. Microsoft, IBM, Google, Salesforce, and Huawei. International giants shape digital Bavaria. Siemens, ESG, Datev, Fujitsu, Infineon, Unify, Amazon, Accenture, Atos, and many others. They are all busy working on digital solutions for tomorrow's world. Over 300,000 employees, more in more than 20,000 Bavarian ITC companies, from startup to global player. Countless talented people from programmers to project managers. Our top universities are pace setters in computer science and production research. We are one of the world's prime industrial locations, boasting a unique network of DACs, companies, and SMEs from industry and science. Bavaria offers an academic and professional education system that is highly admired by, all, by experts all over the world. To cut it short, the best choice of venue for the ICs in 40 years. Those of you who would like to extend your stay for a few more days or years or decades are more than welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, this all has started uh, in the middle of the 19th century, actually, when uh, Bavarian King Maximilian II uh, decided to um, bring the brightest scholars from um, Germany, and they were focused on the northern part of Germany, to Munich, when uh, he 
um, decided to open Bavaria for the brightest people, for the newest ideas, um, to make Bavaria an attractive uh, place for the brightest scholars, researchers, inventors, um, and this is where we uh, never stopped. This way of thinking is that we never stopped. It's not the spirit of whining and uh, complaining, but it's the spirit of innovation that will help um, to find solutions for all those challenges that we are facing nowadays. And that is why we um, put ourselves in this, uh, I would say, very impressive um, 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 history. To make sure that Bavaria remains in the Champions League, we are investing now 2 billion euro in technology. It's the high-tech agenda, agenda Bavaria that has been devised for the entire legislative uh, period and consists of four harmonized programs. Shortly, re just recently announced by our Minister President Markus Söder. It's uh, first the artificial intelligence and super tech program worth 600 million euro. It's uh, second the redevelopment and ex acceleration program for higher education endowed with 600 million euro. It's third, the higher education reform, especially university law reform, with 400 million euro. And it's fourth, a campaign for boosting small and medium-sized enterprises with 400 million euro. This is, in total, a 2 billion euro thrust into the future for 1,000 new professorships and 10,000 new student places, primarily for technology and computer science. What is more, we are creating more than 20 cutting-edge research centers for the entire state and are accelerating regional proje proje projects at our universities in Bavaria. Our model is the modern entrepreneurial, open and international university of the future. This also means generous permission granted to professors and universities to set up or participate in startups. We want even more knowledge and research intensive spin-offs from our universities like the Munich startup Celonis. We intend to strengthen informatics as a discipline at universities. We will be offering 5,000 places for students of computer science. Furthermore, we are investing in quant quantum technology and aim to launch a Bavarian quantum computer. We are also investing in aerospace, clean tech, and artificial intelligence. The whole of Bavaria is set to become the leading artificial intelligence district with Munich as a world-class AI center. To do this, we are setting up 100 AI chairs across Bavaria. This is where you come in. And we are supporting small and medium-sized businesses in this digital transformation with a total of 400 million euro in three, three strong funds. The digital fund with 230 million, the startup fund with 50 million, and the automotive fund with 120 million. Altogether, one of the largest digital funding programs of all German states for medium-sized business. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have now gained the impression that Bavaria and not Berlin is the place in Germany for digital opportunities, then you are right. Seize these opportunities. Not just the opportunity to host this 40th ICIS, for which my sincere thanks go to Professor Hasso Plattner, who has rendered invaluable services to Bavaria, to its economy and science, and Professor Jane Fedorovich, as well as Professor Dr. Helmut Kretschmer, who brought this conference to Germany. To all academics and experts in the fields of computer science, a very warm welcome, enlighten us, and enjoy Munich. Thank you very much.
finally. Um, <laughs> welcome to ICIS uh, in Munich, uh, Germany. Uh, thanks you to Florian Hermann for giving an, us an enlightening speech. We are really excited to have you here in the capital of Bavaria that you have been described a little. We hope that you have time to visit and explore the beautiful old city Marienplatz, Frauenkirche and more. Munich is the heart of arts and culture in Germany and there are many opportunities to visit music, art and museum events while you're here. Um, that's why you have a public transportation ticket on the back of your ticket that you just can use to well, go away from the conference. Some say that just walking in the city is like visiting an open air museum of old and modern things alike. While well, Munich is the heart of arts, culture, and entertainment, the theme of ICIS 2019 is information systems as the heart of innovation ecosystems. This conference has evolved into an incredibly unique gathering of IS colleagues presenting research, sharing projects, and more. ICIS has created an ecosystem of innovation as IS leaders from around the world develop and share new research and meet new colleagues. We hope you leave ICIS not only encouraged for the future of IS innovation, but also inspired to grow our ecosystem. For the 40th ICIS, we added a mix of innovations, including the Munich Experience Program. I hope you enjoyed sports events as well as other events to come, childcare, the buddy program for professional attendees. Another exciting innovation where we need your help is the information systems genealogy to find out where the colleagues from today came from and where their PhD advisors came from is an interesting topic and we need your help, so please visit the AIS booth and add your uh, information. We are excited to welcome three keynotes spanning from the largest software in the world today to inclusive leadership um, tomorrow to one of the first German unicorn startups um, on Wednesday. We're also happy to welcome more than 2,000 participants. Among them, we would especially like to welcome the two Bentley travel grant recipients who have been awarded first of their kind grants to further their education and research aspirations. We are excited to have awarded more than $18,000 in travel grants, and we hope that we can continue these opportunities. This innovative approach to a 40-year-old conference could not take place without an incredibly gifted and engaged conference committee. As co-chairs, we are indebted to the tireless work of our volunteers. Our program co-chairs, Wai Fang Bo, Jan Marco Leimeister, and Sunil Watzel will join us on stage during the awards lunch tomorrow. But we wanted to take a few moments to thank our entire large committee. So please stand if you served on the ICIS 2019 Conference Committee. Everybody up. You're <laughs> Where's up. my minute? Thank you. However, the success of ICIS 2019 isn't just due to the outstanding program, volunteers, and large amount of attendees. We could not do it without the help of our sponsors. Special thanks go to our corporate platinum sponsor, SAP, the corporate gold sponsors, BCG, Platinian, Salonis, Henkel, and Münchner Kreis. Our academic platinum sponsors, Tum and Bentley, and our academic gold sponsors, Oberon University and Fortis. A conference of this magnitude could not happen without these numerous sponsors. Thanks also go to our exhibitors. Throughout the conference, you will have many opportunities to visit them at the refreshment and networking breaks. Join me in thanking our sponsors and our exhibitors. Now we'd like to welcome AIS President Alan Dennis to the stage. Alan Dennis is Professor of Information Systems in the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. His research focuses on three main themes, team collaboration, IT for the subconscious, and digital innovation. 
In addition to his presidency, he is also editor-in-chief of the new AIS journal, the AIS Transactions on Replication Research. Alan? Thank you, Jane and Helmut, and thank you, Jane and Helmut, for your leadership of this wonderful conference. Thank you to all the volunteers who have made this possible, and thank you for all of you for joining us for this great conference in Munich. This is our 25th anniversary, and I don't have the slide controller. Can you advance the slide? Thank you. Uh, I just assumed there was a clicker. Oh, well. Uh, as part of our 25th anniversary, we have announced a 25 for 25 campaign. 25 initiatives to celebrate our first 25 years and to build for the next 25 years. Let me highlight a few of these initiatives. We have initiatives that focus on the profession. One of our new initiatives is AIS in Practice, led by Dennis Galetta which is providing reviews and summaries of our research for practitioners and CIOs. Uh, we have also partnered with Science to Practice, led by Dov Taini, Jan van Braca, and Stefan Seidel, who are doing the same thing and have been doing the same thing in Europe. We are joining forces to do this together. We have a partnership with SIM, the Society for Information Management, which is the largest organization of CIOs in the United States. They are gonna be taking our research articles, the summaries, and sending them to all their members and inviting our members to speak at their local chapters. You can see we have other initiatives focused on education. We have initiatives focused on research. We have many initiatives focused on our community, our members. Let me highlight two there. Uh, we have the Bocconi Travel Grants. Uh, with thanks to the University of Bocconi, they are providing grants for students from lower income countries to attend our conference. Let me also point out our scholarships for student memberships. These fund memberships in the association for students from lower income countries. And let me also thank Jason Thatcher for starting this program. Uh, we have partnerships with IBM. Thank you, IBM. We also are announcing a partnership with the Decision Science Institute in the United States. Um, and finally, I wanna to point to some of the initiatives we have focusing on the society. We have a Grand Challenges program led by Lakshmi Iyer, which focuses on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So if you or your SIG are interested in trying to improve society, specifically the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or other large Grand Challenge projects, come talk to Lakshmi or me and we will work with you to launch a program. I also want to thank Steve Elliott and Rick Watson for launching our first one, which is a Grand Challenge initiative on sustainability and global warming. So these are all looking forward. Let me show you a brief video which describes our past and also looks forward. AIS started as a vision collection of thought leaders throughout the academic world of information systems who came together to advance the development, implementation and evaluation of the field. Even before the start of our association, we came together to serve, to research, to promote and to improve our field. Forty senior academics from across the globe came together to help form the early documents of AIS, including the Constitution and bylaws. Before they knew it, more than 1,800 people signed on to be charter members of the organization within six months. These 40 volunteers and 1,800 charter members laid the groundwork for a culture of service to the organization, which is unmatched in many other professional organizations. Their dedication to their research, their teaching, and their community continues to this day, as AIS now boasts more than 4,600 members. Today, we see the vision of our founders has come to fruition. We have helped to implement a modern, technologically sophisticated professional society. 
we have established standards of practice, ethics and education. And we have created a community of information systems professionals from around the globe who come together to serve the future of our field. Over the years, AIS has evolved into an organization that gives a voice to those disciplines which have never been heard before. The association is now positioned as one of the most trusted voices in the global discourse on information systems. But our work isn't done. As we look to the future of the association, we ask all of you to help in laying the foundation for our next 25 years. We are building on the organization's legacy of service to further advance our field. We are growing into a global organization focused on addressing the challenges of today's researchers. And we are evolving into a modern AIS as a future-focused organization dedicated to serving you, serving your researching, serving our field, and serving the world. So what So let me invite you to get involved in AIS. If you have some new ideas, if you have ideas that can make our association better, improve research, education, improve the practice of IS or address societal needs, come talk to us. We're waiting to hear from you. Let me now ask KK Wei, the chair of our LEO committee, to come to the stage and announce our LEO winners from this year. The AIS NEO Award for Lifetime Exceptional Achievement in Information System, named after one of the world's first commercial applications of computing, the Leon Electronic Office, recognized truly outstanding individual in the information system community, both academics and practitioners, who have made exceptional contributions to research in and or the practice of information system. As the title of the award implies, the contribution of award recipients will have been sustained throughout their career. They will be truly outstanding scholar or practitioner who have made exceptional global contribution in the field of information system. <clears throat> in addition, they will be regarded as a preeminent representative of their national or regional information system community. New award recipients are expected to be a role model and an inspiration to colleagues and students within the information system field. In addition, they should be capable of garnering the respect of individuals from outside the fields other than information system. New award recipients are highly esteemed for their exemplary professional and personal integrity. The first new award goes to Ritu Agawa. <laughs> Ritu Agawa is Distinguished University Professor in Tyrion Dean and the Robert H. Smith Dean Chair of Information System at the Robert H. Smith School of Business, University of Maryland, College Park. She is also the founding director of the Center of Health Information and Decision Systems at the Smith School. Dr. Agawa has published more than 100 articles in journals such as Information System Research, MIS Quarterly, Management Science Journal of American Medical Informatics Association's Health Affair. Her research is focused on the digital transformation of healthcare, health analytic, and artificial intelligence application in health. Ritu have to leave the conference early, so she has provided a brief acceptance video for us to enjoy. Good morning. Thank you for this incredible honor. I am truly humbled by it. 
While I'm not able to be present in person, I am thankful for the opportunity to say a few words about my journey in this discipline and the path that brought me here. And most importantly, to acknowledge the vast community of mentors, friends, and mentees without whom this honor would not have been possible. I am truly fortunate to belong to an academic community that spends its time studying critical questions at the intersection of information, technology, organizations, people, and societies. In what other field are scholars confronted with new conundrums and puzzles every day? Which discipline has to contend with relentless innovation that occurs with breathtaking speed? And where else in the academy can researchers claim that the phenomena they study, social media, platforms, artificial intelligence, big data, are exerting profound effects on organizations and societies and are an integral part of the policy discourse? It was on my journey through the IS discipline that I discovered passion and purpose, understanding how information technology and data can effect change in a sector that is consequential for each and every person on this planet, healthcare. Every day, I am energized and excited by what I do. Through the 30 plus years since I finished my PhD, I've had innumerable colleagues, mentors and friends who have been so instrumental in any and all achievements along the way. I don't have the time today to acknowledge everyone personally, but you know who you are. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for inspiring and supporting me. But I would be remiss if I did not mention a few people, and even here I am sure I'm leaving many out. Mohan Taniru, Prabhuta De, Jim Dunn, Bob Smud, my dear friend Samba, Elena, Arun, Anandi, I truly appreciate you. My students and mentees complete the circle and allow me to pay it forward. Corey, Jimin, Jason, Jayway, Brad, and many others. And of course, the extraordinary community that has coalesced around the Conference on Health IT and Analytics for the past 10 years. My colleagues at the Center for Health Information and Decision Systems, Gordon Gao, Kenyon Crowley, without whose efforts none of my achievements would have been possible. Again, my deepest thanks to the Selection Committee and AIS for this honor. I am truly proud to be a member of this community. The second new award goes to Michael D. Meyer. Michael D. Meyer is Professor of Information System at the University of Auckland Business School, Auckland, New Zealand. His research interests are in the area of qualitative research methods in information system, digital transformation, knowledge management, and the social and organizational aspect of information technology. Michael has published more than 25 journal articles in the AIS Basket of Eight. He won the Best Paper Award with Heinz Klein for the most outstanding paper published in MIS Quarterly in 1999. This paper has been cited over 6,000 times and is one of the top 10 most cited papers in MIS Quarterly. He is listed on the MIS Quarterly website as one of the most prolific authors in MIS Quarterly. Michael. I'm very honored to receive this award. I'd like to start by thanking the first person who really kick-started my career, and that was Paul Gray. Paul was so welcoming to me and my family when we went to a visit at Claremont Graduate University way back in 92. He gave me some excellent advice about my career. He was very generous with his time, and I still remember him today. It was there I got to know Lorne Olfman and Lynn Marcus, wonderful colleagues. That same year, 1992 was my very first ICIS. It was held in Dallas. I remember attending a, a ISIS, IC, sorry, ICIS panel debate, and it was there that I heard Heinz Klein giving a talk at a panel session. I thought it was great. So I went up to talk to Heinz, and uh, we ended up having a beer together. And by the way, he's from Munich. And then two years later, he visited Auckland, 
And over time, of course, Heinz became one of my favorite co-authors. A few years later, I've been welcomed to many places around the world, to Southampton by David Averson and Joan Andakuma, Georgia State University, done work with Richard Baskerville for many years and his colleagues there. Every time I go to Atlanta, I think no visit is complete without having some southern barbecue and a visit to Stone Mountain. I've also appreciated the hospitality of so many of our colleagues. We have wonderful friends in, in almost every city of the world, whether it's Jungjin and Claremont uh, in uh, 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 Jungjin or Toure, Mike Newman in Manchester, going to see a, a Manchester United play a game, Brent at Queen's University, Canada. So many excellent colleagues in this field. And of course, I've had great support from my own university. And most of all, I'd like to thank my wife, Kathleen. She's put up with me traveling around the world. Uh, she's continued to support me all this time. Thank you very much. The final new award goes to Arun Rai. Arun Rai is regional, Regents Professor of the University Systems of Georgia, holds the Robinson Chair and is Director of the Center for Digital Innovation at the Robinson College of Business at Georgia State University. He has held visiting appointment at University in Australia France, Germany, Hong Kong, and Slovenia. He is a fellow of the Association for Information System and a distinguished fellow of the Informs Information System Society. Arun. Thank you, KK, for your kind words, and thank you to the Leo Awards Committee. I'm extremely honored to be receiving the award. I would also like to congratulate Ritu and Mike for the richly deserved recognition. I've had the privilege to be part of our vibrant community and to work with many outstanding people over the last 30 years. To my current and former PhD students, I've learned a ton from you, patience at times, and a lot more. There's no greater high for me than hearing about your achievements and to see you keep our pact of paying it forward. To my collaborators across research traditions and world regions, the joy has been making sense of our work and our field over late night Skype calls or a nice meal, and above all, in our friendship. Thanks to my Dean Rich Phillips and former Dean Fenwick Huss for not constraining me to a shoebox, but supporting my aspirations to build an interdisciplinary platform for work on digital innovation, which has progressed from e-commerce to supply chains to analytics to AI. To my co-conspirators at the Center for Digital Innovation, thank you for part, being part of an incredible journey of building a sandbox where we reject silos and embrace diversity. To my colleagues in the CIS department at Georgia State University, I cherish our camaraderie and journey over the years in maintaining a top 10 program. On a closing note, I was talking to Elena, my spouse, about my remarks and said I should not forget to thank our family. With her usual wit, she said, especially your wife. <laughs> She's my better half, best friend, and force of reason. Our daughter has used her magic to always put things in perspective. An ice cream outing with her quickly puts away stressors like Reviewer 3 and tough p and decisions. My mother, who's always believed in me, has held an unwavering belief that I could make a difference. With the amazing colleagues, friends, and family that I've had for this journey, this award is because of you. Thank you again.
So thank you very much, KK, and the LEO committee for selecting our winners. It is always one of those wonderful things that we get to do. Let me invite Helmut and Jane back on the stage. And my mistake. John Mooney, if you would care to join us as well. The AAS Leadership Excellence Award is given annually to a single person for leadership and innovation in the use and development of information systems. In this case, the recipient was selected in recognition of his theoretical and practical advancement in the field of information systems by the Association of Information Systems Leadership Excellence Award. According to some observations, uh, you have really done two major things. You have uh, put forward a consistent business administration view of organizational processes and their continuous improvement using information technology. And second, the topic of real-time analysis has been the forefront on your mind for more than 30 years. In 1983, I had to look that up carefully, uh, we had a heated discussion on whether it was really necessary for invoices uh, that were required once a month to be processed in real time. The success of the HANA database in memory database now proves you right and shows that you are a vis visionary and forward thinker always ahead of the time. Your obsession with detail and the instinct for future de technology topics underpin the entrepreneurial skills personal and selfless support of the sciences by founding and supporting the Hasse Plattner Institute in Potsdam, the D School in Stanford, shows that you're not only a unique entrepreneur, but also an excellent person trying to advance what science can have from information technology. The entire information systems discipline wishes to express their deepest gratitude for this lifetime achievement. AIS and the ICS committee are pleased to announce Hasse Plattner as the 2019 AIS Leadership Excellence Award winner. So please come up. And before um, Hasso can enjoy uh, the lovely statue for a long time, we invite you to give us your keynote. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the award. That was a surprise. But I have to stop for a few milliseconds and step aside. Before we listen uh, to us, which we are very eager to, I pray you to all stand up, please. And let's congratulate Helmut, who looks younger than ever. <laughs> Happy Not everybody gets such a birthday, <laughs> birthday gift. Yeah, I want to talk about a next generation data management for cloud-based applications. Um, a few buzzwords we want to simplify. We want to solve the performance problem. We we faced for 72 to 
2016 probably. We want to finally solve scalability. We, won't be a, we want to be able to extend and be much more flexible. So in my job as a professor at the HPI in Potsdam, Hasse Plattner Institute in Potsdam for um, systems engineering, I was not happy with the lecture material I had for several years. And um, so one day I brought all my PhD candidates together and uh, said, we have to do something new. I want to invent, this is on the left side, you can't read it, but it's not, it's the original, that's a photo of the original drawing on the whiteboard. Um, I want to invent a new ERP system. Okay, what is an ERP system, they ask. Um, then I built this drawing, it's only the financial part of an ERP system. Um, they're all computer scientists, so not so much involved in business, and they were also a little bit skeptical when I talk about accounting. Has not the highest uh, um, flair, despite I did accounting all my life. Um, and at the end of this uh, very important session, we had a question to ask, how do we start to build a new system? And I had a few bullet points. And one was simplification, as you heard. Solve performance forever. And what is your idea? What do we want to do differently? I want to develop a system based on the fact that the database response time is zero. Always zero. There is no response time. How would we develop a system? Because my experience was all these years, during my stay at IBM and later SAP, we were fighting volume and as a consequence, transactional volume and as a consequence, performance issues. I want to solve this once and forever. So how do we do this? Where do we get a database with zero response time from? We have to invent it. And then they were excited because uh, first we have to do the database and then perhaps we can do something in the next generation ERP system. So from that day on, we started a development. How could a database look like which comes close to zero response time? Um, that was the beginning of um, the development of uh, SAP HANA, that is the product name now. Um, we had all kinds of fancy uh, research names, Sansa CDB, because it was in Potsdam, and the famous castle in Potsdam. Um, database became reasonably successful. I put this in the beginning, 50,000 customers, uh, 70 terabytes is the largest customer in a um, scale out system, 48 terabytes um, in a single node system, 100 plus million transactions every day processed, seven petabytes if we take all the systems. Actually, this is growing now um, basically weekly. So system became reasonably successful for SAP. And the, what we developed conceptually in the first weeks actually of the project was, if we have a database with supposedly zero response time, why do we separate OLTP and OLAP? We found no reason, but for academic reasons, we did a proof of concept and went to existing customers and measured what kind of database transactions are actually taking place in an OLTP system and an OLAP system. And to our surprise, we found out that the systems don't look different. Um, it's a myth that in OLTP, we are write and update oriented. In an OLAP system, we are read optimized. Modern transactional system need a, as much um, uh, group access to data, um, so sequential access to data, and we could, 
we could um, prove that. And if we take away, because when the system has zero response time, we don't have to prefabricate aggregates in order to reduce response time, which is a huge part of the management information system since the late 60s till 2010, probably. We decided to remove all aggregations, all pre-aggregations from the system, theoretically. Everything will be reduced to recording of events and analyzing events sequentially. Very radical approach, which is now commercially available under the product name S4HANA um, with SAP. Um, the, the distribution of um, database queries is such is so close in both systems that for many years we should have come together much earlier. Instead, we developed separate databases for OLTP systems and for OLAP systems. And in both, we still had performance problems. Um, how do we get rid of the performance problems? First, let us look what's happening in the world of data. 2010, this is where we did uh, most of the HANA research. You can hardly see the 2,000 exabytes we had in the world of data. When you look at 2019, how the total data volume in the world grew. When you look at that SAP system is, I cannot even read this, zero, dot zero 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 two exabytes. This is the SAP production system for ERP. And all SAP customers together are only 0 0.07 exabytes. And we have 40,000 exabytes today. So something happened with data. In 2010, we said we can build a database with nearly zero response time because we keep all data in memory. That was the technical um, solution. We could early, in, in the early 2010s, we could say that most of our SAP customers will be able to run in memory and hardware development in the future will help that all customers can run in memory. Now, looking back nearly 10 years, all customers can run completely in memory. Actually, the, the properties of the database allowed us to compress data by factor five. The compression in um, current databases is zero or is one, no compression, or up to a factor two. So we compress data and we spend quite some time in data tiering. I will talk about this in a second. So first of all, it became true. We can run the largest companies, Exxon, Nestle, etc., in memory. The, this, this is a very important statement because many people didn't believe that this is possible. And it enabled us to rethink commercial systems, how they work. They look much more like normal um, social media systems. We record things and then we have applications which run through the recorded data. We do not follow the MIS design anymore that we prepare. We know which kind of questions users might have, and we prepare already the answer sets by pre-aggregation. So pre-aggregation is completely eliminated and has huge consequences on simplicity of the software. Has uh, removes completely the threat of locking, ABBA locking, the threat of 
response times queuing up under high load, removes the threat of rebuilding the aggregates when we change the rules for the aggregates, the hierarchies, want to have a different reporting, want to have a new reporting. The ultimate flexibility is not to prepare, prepare data at all. Everything is part of an algorithm. For the database internally, we selected a columnar storage. Uh, we had uh, at the university three databases, one from Korea, an in-memory database, one SAP MaxDB relational database built in Berlin, not Munich, sorry. Um, and we had a uh, research database which should have become a Google-type system, um, so it was, it was working with a columnar store. And uh, we experimented with all three databases and came very quickly to the conclusion that a columnar store is probably the most promising. In a columnar store, we have a separate column for each attribute of a tuple, and uh, in order to get a record back together, we have to read and uh, locate at the right position um, the uh, attributes which are requested in the, in the call. Um, you see instantly, this is more expensive to ac than accessing a record and then all the fields are already there inside the record. So it's a little bit more expensive to have the direct access. It's very important that you optimize the system with regards to the projections. That was pretty difficult for SAP. SAP in 95 decided we should always use select star everything because then we are pre already prepared if we extend the software uh, in customization exercises. One of the most stupid decisions I allowed SAP to have um, was really stupid. Um, back to Mr. Cott, really select only what you need. If you want to change it, fine, then you change the statement. The huge difference is when we do sequential processing. Sequential processing always means we have to scan data and filter it because we want to have a subset of the data for this particular purpose. The scanning speed on modern Intel hardware and other hardware is so unbelievable high that we came very close to our zero response time paradigm. Just to give you a feeling, a normal CPU, one core, scans now data at the speed of 8 megabytes per millisecond. That means, if you do the calculation, 2 million customers encoded by dictionary encoded in 4 bytes, that gives a maximum of 4 billion possible addresses, results in eight megabytes, which can be consumed or scanned in less than one millisecond. This is so fast that we can say in this database design, it's in memory, it is compressed by a factor five, and we can scan by any attribute a table has with that eight megabyte per millisecond speed on one core, and if we use 10 cores, then it's 80 megabytes per millisecond. This is close to zero response time, because when we work on the result set and what we have to do to do a decent graphic representation or character representation, it costs much more than accessing the data. So we have, with a simple design, it is in memory. It is completely in memory 
It is not caching. It's a huge difference between caching and have data in memory. Data in memory means a defined subset of the data, a partition, has to be completely in memory so that that's when we scan an attribute column, it is a complete scan for this given partition. A given partition is, for example, the accounting data of the last two years, the materials management movements of the last quarter, etc. It depends on the application. Um, in HR, the complete history of all employees over all the time they worked at the company. We have some internal features which are were known, were in the literature at the time we started. Uh, we store the data in main and a delta storage. We only append data because we, uh, we, we focus on the um, insert of uh, events. So the events were appended. We do not touch the largest part of the database. There is an occasional reorganization, totally automated. Um, with that, we keep the data highly optimized for the fastest possible scanning. And then we, very early on, we started to run in parallel. All my years in SAP, and for quite some time I was responsible for, risk, for not only applications, but also for technology, especially the database part of it, and we never could apply parallelism. I once had a discussion with John Hennessy, then president of Stanford University, and he wrote, together with his colleague Pedersen, a book which is in America the standard for computer science students about hardware and software. And when you scan, look up the index about parallelization, parallelization is hard to come by. You need long sequential processes, steady processes, where you probably can introduce a parallelization. It's three sentences on one page, that's it. In a column store, in memory, you can introduce parallelization relatively easily. The first approach was we hired as guest programmers, um, somebody, somebody from artificial intelligence and one from gaming. The guy from gaming was the breakthrough because they all, they do everything in parallel. The, um, so they are totally used to it. What, you don't do parallel processing? What are you doing? Um, so the scanning, we split up the scanning in uh, scanning of chunks in parallel, and then we combined the results that we did this for joints, we did this for all kinds of sequential operations in the database. You don't have to understand this tree here. It's, it's, it's just showing that we again and again try to parallelize. Um, so on the lowest level, we, we parallelize the um, scanning, we parallelize um, the, uh, that, that, that we have multiple data partitions which we can access in parallel. So same table, split over multiple partitions, we can run the query split over multiple partitions. And we can, if we have, a, it's now a feature of the database, it's, uh, it can partition in two dimensions. So we can apply pruning if we know that we only want to access American data of 2019 in accounting, then this is a subset of data. If we have partitioned by countries and by time, which is one good criteria or two good criteria, um, then we can access only the partition of American data in 2019, which is probably in SAP, 25% of the data. Um, probably 12% because 
we don't take the 2019 year. So it's another, it's another 5 to 10 times faster. With partitioning, with parallel processing uh, along the scanning operation, with separation of query preparation and execution, we can achieve a performance which is close to the projected zero response time. Close enough. It is now underneath all SAP systems. <coughs> and it's probably the main reason why SAP systems have a um, renewed success in the recent years. The <coughs> I started with the pre-aggregation. If we don't do pre-aggregation, you can change the hierarchies and run the query, and we have a new result. If you want to change it again, you can run it again. If you want to introduce a new hierarchy, introduce a new hierarchy, and we just aggregate the data along the new hierarchy is an extremely helpful feature for the people in business. I'm just looking at our CEO. Um, for all these years I did, for a while I did consulting, and then somebody wanted to um, have a different aggregation in the P&L, especially Americans. Uh, and I say, ah, we can only do, we can do, yeah, we can probably do two. Um, and when somebody said, I want to have a third one, um, then we had to start programming. Huge, the flexibility. And when I tell you that a P&L statement in SAP is less than three seconds, is that still true, Christian? Yes? yes? Somebody said yes. Um, <laughs> I have a, we had a hobby at the university. We want to make programs as fast as we could. So we took Dunning. So, working out the people who haven't paid and uh, write a letter to them. It runs at SAP, ran then, so probably 10 years ago. It ran 1,200 seconds. 1,200 seconds. Um, so 20 minutes. And the students were bringing it down to 10 seconds, 5 seconds, 3 seconds, and we had a meeting, international meeting, with video conference, and one guy sitting in Potsdam said, we are below one second. And somebody from my company said, shaking his head, I have never heard a request that a Dunning program should run faster than a second. This is like, I have never heard a request that a car should drive with one liter per 100 kilometers. Yes, it is possible Dunning runs a second. What does that mean? It is not a batch program anymore. So there are no batch programs anymore. Everything is a transaction. Why did we have batch programs? Because we had long running transactions and we scheduled them for overnight processing because we did it all our life in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. It's not necessary anymore. Everything is a transaction now. And actually, there's a pretty short transaction. Remember the chart I showed you with the explosion of data in the world? And this is touching the operational systems of companies as well. We want to keep all relevant data relevant for permanent access in memory. But there is a lot of data we still have to keep and we have to access from time to time and we don't need it in memory. So we have now next to the in-memory storage a columnar store on, on storage, um, disk or SSD, today all SSD. And we keep the data there in the same format in columns. It is probably 
10 to 50 times slower, but it doesn't matter because these are applications which are only periodically needed or we research something, we have to do an audit of the last 10 years because something happened and uh, IRS or other institutions are asking us to go back and show them how we handle data. Did somebody say Trump? No, okay. I, um, so we have the data capacity extremely, extremely um, extended. If you make a mistake in assigning a data, a table or a partition of a table to the wrong data layer, then we change it and per push button, the data moves up from SSD to in memory. So we have no data size restriction anymore. It's very comforting for our customers who are a little bit nervous that hardware development, uh, DRAM development, or persistent storage development are not fast enough for their growing ERP data. So this restriction has been removed. Very important, I repeat this, this is not caching. This is partitioning, assigning to partitions, assigning to 100% in memory or 100% on disk. Not most recently used, least most recently used, we keep 95% in memory, that's the same. No, it's not the same because of the sense sequential processing. The sequential processing only works if the um, the data we are searching is well-defined. So it's either this year or the last two years, then we know exactly what data we search and not the data which was most frequently used. As I said, we have basically covered the, last, the largest systems in the world. We had a a job to do by, for, for Walmart, where we had to keep 200 million records in memory, and the response time for all queries should never be more than eight seconds. And we had a competition against all the other databases in the world, and not surprisingly, per definition, we won because of the in-memory the partitioning concept, the parallelism inside the system. Um, then the storage goes further. There is a relational data lake. Um, this is um, a, of what we inherited uh, when SAP bought Sybase. So I don't want to go into this as an SAP chart, actually. Uh, just keep in mind uh, that the system is working on multiple layers. Then the interesting development in the recent years was that we could integrate the analytics capabilities SAP had in the last development in the last 10 years or acquired in the last 10 years, that we could rebuild them basically sitting on top of the data storage inside the database, which has tremendous advantages, the super fast access that we can use uh, um, some, or reuse some operators and have a very sophisticated analytics system now with geospatial math, with predictive math, um, self-learning, and we use it for machine learning. Um, so this turned out to be very, very nice and is coming now into all applications, but I want to spend some time on another aspect of the system, and this is the federated data access. Federated data access is, was in, in the database uh, community available for many years. We have um, uh, made this now a major component of the database that we can access data other locations in remote locations through standard query language 
the important fact is that we do not move complete tables anymore, but only answer sets. First of all, they are much smaller. Second, we keep the authorization completely in the hands of the source system. We don't transport data and then invent a new um, authorization scheme. We use the authorization scheme of the original data source, whether these are SAP systems or non-SAP systems. It's very important because of data security, the biggest threat for losing data to outside um, perpetrators is data transports. Eliminating data transports as much as possible, just send around result sets. Then we did something um, in, the, in the last years to separate the data processing and the data storage part in the database. Um, logically, they were always somehow separated in one system, but when we talked to our head of the database development, uh, there was enough interleaving which made it complicated to separate them. We can separate them now, and with that we can do something which is very interesting. We can separate compute and storage. Um, this is an SAP term. It's not an academic term. SAP called it data spaces. We can set up a system, a normal system, has a complete database, has its own tables, and access via federation tables in another system. What can we do with that? We can have a large oper operational data system, and we put a data, data space next to it where we have either no, no extra tables or we have individual tables which are only stored here. We have probably new features in the database or in the analytics compartment and access the data without of the operational system without changing the operational system. With that, we can test all kinds of applications without interfering with the operational system. Very important. We can keep these applications outside the operational system. In this case, marketing. Marketing is a development in SAP which is behind the um, leaders in the market. So they have to hurry, they have to update the system permanently in order not to disturb the rest of the system. Yes, they access data of the operational system, read-only, but have their own data and their own events, and they record them in a separate system using the same or an advanced version of the database system. We believe that this is a huge step forward, in, especially in cloud environments, where we have to permanently enhance our systems. It is, uh, I was skeptical, probably five years ago, whether we can achieve this. We are down now to our weekly updates of our cloud systems. Um, we have reduced the number of people by a factor five who are necessary to monitor the updates, and we will further automate this process. Um, we have basically permanent development of our systems available on the cloud. This speeds any other deployment by miles. Um, this alone is a reason why cloud will be totally superior um, in comparison to on-premise deployments. I wanted to prove that this database is not only for SAP, because you know SAP and you optimize the database for SAP usage. It's not true. The, the concept of the database, the academic concept of the database was for any kind of application. 
in the last three years. We developed a database for health data. Um, and uh, took some time. It's not easy to get data. IBM knows that. IBM bought a company to have access to data. I made a donation to an American university to get data. We finally got 9 million, um, 9 million health records of uh, 9 million individuals in New York. Um, we got the system loaded. It's a total of uh, 2.4 billion records. And uh, with all kinds of diagnostics, uh, medical observations, uh, so a whole variety of healthy people and people who unfortunately uh, went sick. The, the university had their own database for years and we took, in this case, I have only a sample of five, um, five different major, major runs through the database with the appropriate, um, re the uh, relevant uh, response times. And then we did the same on this Data for Health database, which is based on, on HANA. We found out that the average response time before we did any major tuning is a thousand times faster. What does that mean? My daughter did a PhD at the Cape Town University and she could do one run, and it was highly data, data oriented. She could do one run on her computer per day. And sometimes it didn't run because there was a power outage in Cape Town very often, or the computer didn't run 24 hours. If she could have run 10 or 1,000 times faster, she would have saved at least two years in her PhD. We cannot see or foresee how much this will impact medical research. I cannot wait till other university clinics or other institutions are using this database on HANA and experience this unbelievable acceleration and speed. To define a cohort, to select out of the 9 million records, the probably 50,000 you want to observe. How fast you can do this, how fast you can recut the definition of the cohort, and then do your um, uh, analysis, and then get the results basically in seconds and then refine your query, then start thinking again, then make your next step, step in the contribution. The potential is huge. The database with nearly zero response time was the product of a frustrated um, business system chair at a university because what I lectured there and uh, the student didn't like it that much because can't you talk about something more modern like Facebook or, or, or Google? Why do we have to do accounting? Um, turned out that they all are, became um, very happy because when you achieve academically something and uh, um, it becomes a major product in the market, a multi-billion euro product. This is quite report, rewarding. The only thing, because we didn't really have this at that time, established, uh, the minister was talking about it. Um, my colleagues who did the major work here, they are all disappointed that we didn't put this research into a separate startup company and all became filthy rich. Thank you very much.
We wouldn't let you go without any calories. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll just close it up. Thank you, Hasse, for a fascinating speech bringing back the academ academic background to main memory databases and giving us a chance to say thank you for being in this um, keynote uh, session. We talked about uh, your public transportation ticket that was sitting in the script. But we need to do that. Any more housekeeping, Jane? Just to remind you, we have three lovely uh, keynotes this, this conference, a little bit one of our unique uh, features of the conference, and so we look forward to seeing you again in another session tomorrow morning. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Great day.